its member states. And also we can see it in the NATO that we lack common memory, the memory from 20th century, and also the memory, the recent memory for the last two decades in 21st century. And that is something I would just love to hear how it would bring and shape, you know, the understanding. And understanding only comes when we have shared values and also the memory. Thank you. Um, thank you. Two, two great questions. Uh, first of all, has, has Canada done more than its share? No. Canada has done its share. We, we do what we feel is right, and we don't think about share. We don't think about, you know, who's, who's doing more, who's doing less. We will do what, what we can and what we feel is right. I mean, Canada stepped up uh, consistently in, in Europe in, the, in two world wars. Uh, we have a tradition of understanding that, you know, Canadians are lucky to be, uh, to be where we are geographically in the world, and that with that luck comes a responsibility uh, to reach out and do what we can to make the world a better place. And that's why, you know, there are, you know, millions of Canadians around the world and NGOs and organizations uh, very much engaged with the international community in trying to contribute, trying to shape uh, a better world because not just out of altruism but because we know very much that if we can help provide some answers to how to build more resilient societies, stable, peaceful democracies uh, in the 21st century, uh, then it's better for everyone. Uh, economically, but also in terms of uh, you know, tangible uh, uh, lives. We are proud of having stepped up on the trenches of World War I, the beaches of World War II, uh, and in, in international peacekeeping and NATO elements. It's a, a sense of, of you know, who we are as Canadians, and we will always look for more opportunities to do that, and we'll always look for how we can best help. We're not the, the biggest country, we don't have the deepest pockets, uh, but there are things that Canadians do as well, if not slightly better than uh, anyone else in the world, and we will always be ready to help shape and contribute that, because we know that sharing you know, our solutions and what we've done well uh, can often you know, help other people figure out, well, what will work for them? And that's, that sense of shared responsibility is something that Canada has deeply, perhaps because we draw people from everywhere around the world and continue to, uh, but also because we know that, that we, we have a responsibility to do what we can uh, to create a better world. And a big part of it to flow into that is understanding the mistakes and the challenges of the past. Uh, Canada has uh, just celebrated its 150th, uh, 150th birthday uh, last year, uh, but at the same time, because our country is uh, the one that has you know, figured out better than anyone else that diversity is a source of strength, not a source of, dif uh, of weakness, uh, that it's about resilience. We have learned from people who come to Canada everywhere around the world, whether it's uh, Afghan refugees, whether it's Syrian refugees recently, uh, or uh, whether it's some of the previous generations of people fleeing from uh, Uganda and the Idi Amin years, uh, the boat people from Vietnam, or, or uh, the wave of migrations we got in the uh, post-World War II years from Europe. You know, we understand tangibly how things could be worse and where things have been bad around the world. And being able to remember that or reflect on how we can do better, how we can create a society that, that is based around values and not identity, uh, based around principles and rights uh, and opportunity, real and fair chances for everyone to succeed. Those kinds of principles, I think, are going to be extraordinarily important in the 21st century. As we get flows of migrations, of people looking for better lives, people fleeing you know, resource depletion, environmental calamities and conflicts, we have to start thinking about how we create societies that look at different stories as opportunities to learn and grow grow within your societies rather than trying to keep uh, the challenges of the world outside of your borders. And that reflection on how to, how to be open and stronger because of that openness and resilience is, I think, uh, something that NATO and indeed our sort of collective uh, developed world is going to have to grapple with in a more and more real way and not just in an intellectual think tank way uh, with all due respect to everyone in this room uh, but in a tangible way how do we make 
you know, ordinary folks who are going through living their lives, not thinking a lot about politics or international conflicts, but how do we get ordinary folks to understand that resilient, diverse communities is a better outcome, that being there to support your neighbor makes you better and, and creates more opportunities for you as well, that yes, being engaged on the far side of the world to rebuild a broken state uh, is actually in your best interest. And yes, we need to take care of you know, the, the, the poverty and the challenges we have at home, each of us. But we also have to look at what we do to alleviate stress, tensions, misery around the world because if we don't, the trend lines we'll be on as a world uh, will leave us all poorer poorer off uh, in every different way. So this sense of collective responsibility, we've figured out, NATO countries, a pretty good model of how to support citizens, how to create strong governance uh, with freedom, with security, with all those things. And it's under stress right now. It's under tension from people who are anxious about where uh, their, their paychecks are gonna come from, where their kids' jobs are gonna come from. And our responsibility is not to enhance or exaggerate or profit from those anxieties out there. Our responsibility is to allay those fears, to tell people, look, we have faced down massive challenges as a world in the past, and we did it by coming together and standing side by side for what we knew was right. We can again, and we need to again do that. Recognize that the rise of populism, of, of aggressive nationalism, of, 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 of polarization in our public discourse in Canada and elsewhere around the world needs to be responded to with strong, confident, positive, rational messages about how we can solve these challenges together. And there is no better example of that than the extraordinary success that NATO has had over the past almost 70 years, and indeed will continue to have in a way that is more relevant today than it ever has been before. I think we actually don't need a coffee break because I think we got shots of inspiration from all three of you that will keep us going over the next two days. But I think the resolve and commitment that all three of you showed to the NATO alliance is what we're hoping will come out of the summit overall. But Mr. Prime Minister, the comment you made about we can articulate what our interests are and what our values are, but that only matters if we stand up to support and defend them, and that's really what we mean by NATO engages. And so I think that idea of standing up for things we believe in is also a really powerful one. I want to ask you to join me in thanking our Dream Team from Canada, but I also want to ask you to please stay seated and allow them to leave the room, because you, as you can imagine, they're on a very tight schedule. But please do join me in thanking the Prime Minister.